Good evening, everyone. I'm Bernard Schwartz, the director of the Unterberg Poetry Center, and it's my privilege to welcome you to tonight's program. On behalf of the Poetry Center, I would like to take this opportunity to thank some of our seasoned supporters. The Greenwood family, the National Endowment for the Arts, Eva Yuzdan, Joan and Jack Jacobson, the Kaplan Foundation, Amazon, and the New York State Council on the Arts. We are also grateful to the Library of America, whose anthology, Becoming Americans, Four Centuries of Immigrant Writing, served as both the inspiration and the impetus for this evening's event. At the end of tonight's program, which will feature about an hour of conversation and readings, the participants have kindly agreed to answer questions from the audience. If you have a question, simply approach one of the microphones at the front of each aisle. Afterward, we invite you to, all, we invite you to join us for a book signing in the art gallery just next door. Copies of the anthology will be available for purchase at that time, courtesy of Barnes & Noble. Before we begin, I wanted to relay the unfortunate news that due to illness, Gary Steingart is unable to join us this evening. That said, I'm proud to be able to mention that he will be joining us in the fall when his new novel has been published. And now, please welcome Jessica Hagedorn, Jamaica Kincaid, Norman Miner, and Alain Stefans. Well, good evening. It is a, an enormous pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you for coming, and thank you to my three guests for their willingness to participate in the anthology, Becoming American, um, and also for the, your presence here and the conversation that we are about to engage in. Um, the idea is the following. We will um, in, uh, let thoughts, free flow for uh, 30, 40 minutes among us on the topic of home and language and belonging and assimilation and what it means or doesn't to become an American. And after that, we will welcome uh, questions from the audience. I beg you that um, if you are going to ask a question that it is brief, uh, sharp, to the point, and you can direct it to either the four of us or to an individual in particular, um, and um, that will enable the, the, the rhythm to continue. Um, I would like to start with um, your first impressions about the United States. Each of you uh, came to this country uh, at a different time for different reasons, uh, and most mostly from a different part of the world. If you can uh, relieve with us, just for a few minutes, what was that first impression, that first sight uh, of the United States, um, if there was such a moment, or if that sight was part of your imagination, uh, even before you arrived? Norman, you came at the age of 50? Uh, at 52. 52. I was the youngest here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, when I came to the States, uh, it was 1988. Still, the communist uh, system was in power in Eastern Europe. So I did not travel a lot, and America was a faraway place. Um, the first impression was of a very strange place, strange world, with a huge, overwhelming diversity, and still with some elements which were so-called European. So uh, 
I was first uh, in Washington with a Fulbright there at the Catholic University, and we lived in a, in a suburb where it was extremely quiet and with uh, very, I would say, common people, uh, some of them quite poor, and we felt there very well, I must say. <laughs> Uh, in a way, we regained a kind of familiar atmosphere. Mm. Now, in, in, in the excerpt of your memoir that I ended up including, you talk about uh, your arrival to New York City, and you describe the Upper West Side, thereabouts in the 70s, uh, as paradise. Has that concept of paradise changed 20 years after? Is it still paradise? The irony of the term didn't change. <laughs> it was ironic then, and it is still, <laughs> still like that, or all the more so? What? Is it even more now? More ironical? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it has still the side of wonder and of uh, great surprise. And it still has uh, the, the other one, which I understand better, now than at that time, because 20 years passed, so I saw, I saw the, I will not say the paradisical uh, side, but the very wonderful side of this country, and I saw and I understood better the other side of it. Hmm. But I'm here now. At that time, I was not here, even if I was here. Hmm. Jamaica, you came as an au pair. Oh, yes. Uh, actually, I came as a servant, um, but um, which I like, I like to call it what it was. I came as a servant because that was really going to be my life, that I would um, uh, wait on other, on other people. And I came from something that most people would consider a paradise, really. It's a place where the, the rain, rain never comes, the sun always shines, there's never snow, uh, you can walk outside and pick a fruit and eat it, and you can swim in the ocean in your clothes, and shortly it will be dry if, once you walk out of the ocean. Um, but I absolutely hated that place, um, not so now, uh, and uh, felt when I came to America that I never wanted to see it again, um, this extraordinary paradise. And I came to America in the middle of winter, and I thought it was, I, I didn't really come to America. I came to New York, which is something <laughs> entirely different. I came to see, and though I did think New York was America. And um, I found it e extremely, uh, not beautiful. That word had not entered my vocabulary yet, beautiful. I found it just incredibly uh, mm, uh, shocking um, how the buildings were so tall. I'd never been in an elevator. I'd never been in cold. I'd never, everything was entirely new. And all the new was in some ways painful, but I loved it. And um, it's still sort of my experience with America. It's incredibly painful, but I love it. Painful in what sense? But I had no money, I had no family, I had really nothing. Um, everything was in incredibly strange and new, and the new is always strange. Um, but as I say, I, I, I loved that about it. I loved that I didn't know it, that I would have to learn it. I enjoyed learning it, um, though only in retrospect, only as I speak of it now at the time, I didn't know that it would yield anything enjoyable, but I liked um, not liked, again, I thought there was no uh, alternative. I didn't want an alternative. Um, I, the experience of being in what I thought was America uh, was, um, I, I, it, I felt, I, I suppose, lucky. Um, and the reason for it was that I thought the the thing I had left behind, I would never know it again. Um, that turns out, of course, to be impossible. 
And it is knowing the thing that I left behind that has made um, living in America possible because I write about it and I earn a living. So there was a sense of, of, of almost redemption of, at the act of arriving here and looking back and saying, at that point, I'm, not, I'm here and this is no, but this is extraordinary. I don't know that I want to use the word redemption. Too heavy. Yes, and, um, uh, and it makes the experience um, something that it, uh, holy, and it will only be holy when I'm dead. I want it to remain profane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jessica, coming from the Philippines, the first impression? Well, visually, I remember my mother woke us up. We were on a boat, and uh, to look through the porthole at um, the Golden Gate Bridge, because we were arriving in San Francisco, and it was maybe four in the morning, and uh, I remember I was 14 years old and grumpy and, you know, also very nervous about coming because even though, in a way, our conversation earlier, Jamaica, listening to you say, you know, you, you, you immerse yourself in these books and, and um, thought about these faraway places, which I did as well, and I always thought I would leave the Philippines, but I wasn't ready to leave when we left. It was very harsh um, and not a happy time. So the idea of wake up and look at the Golden Gate Bridge, I wasn't sure I was ready, but of course I, you know, okay, this is the first sighting. And um, it, it was a little nerve wracking. It was very foggy and it looked cold outside the porthole. And, uh, you know, it was a lot for us to take in. Um, overwhelming, hmm. yeah. I should qualify something that uh, Jessica just said. Just before this session, we had a conversation with students in, in which we, the four of us, were asked a number of different questions about our own beginnings as writers, the writers that influenced us in our own home, com home country, in the negotiation between the place that it was once home and today, and there might be, on occasion, references to that earlier conversation so that you know where it's coming from. Um, Norman, you and I know each other for, for, I don't know, 15 years, and every so often when I think of you as a writer, I, I think that uh, had you had the choice, you would not be here, you would have stayed in Romania, and I don't know if that's accurate, but I wonder if you could say something about it. Yes, it's, it's correct. You would not be an immigrant, you uh, would be I there. didn't want to leave, and I didn't want to come here. Uh, I was, in a way, forced to, to leave, and uh, in another way, I was uh, forced to come here. Uh, I mean, I left in 86, when the situation there was, was already terrible, and it was late. Um, I was late, generally speaking, in a lot of decisions. I'm not the firm, clear guy. I'm an hesitating guy. And uh, what happened with me is that I, I really didn't want to, to lose my language. It was not that I was happy or, or I had a lot of privileges there, which I didn't. Uh, so I went uh, with a grant to Berlin. I lived there almost two years and then uh, I tried to find another postponement. I didn't want to, I couldn't go back, and I didn't want to stay. So it's, it's uh, so you may call it a typical situation of a writer. <laughs> and uh, I uh, was offered a Fulbright grant uh, here, and I came here for 10 months. And there are, uh, as you see, 22 years. So this is uh, the story. In the I situation? was afraid uh, of America. I thought uh, it, it doesn't, I, will, I will not fit, and it doesn't fit me. But uh, we are uh, survivors. And, and, um, and yet the, the situation after Ceausescu changed in your country, and 
there could have been an opportunity to reverse immigration and go back and be there, um, but it wasn't an option? It was an option, uh, and uh, time and reality proved uh, step by step that it was not. I mean, I wanted to go back. It was, there were only three years since I left. And when I left, the, the, entire, the hope of the entire country was that it will be a biological end. Nobody envisioned this, this collapse of communism, but that the dictator will finally die, mm -hmm. and there will come another one which will not be so bad. This was the entire uh, uh, thinking, way of thinking. Uh, but, uh, and I wanted at the beginning to go back. I had already a lot of friends here in exile, and some of them also wanted to go back. Step by step, we, we, uh, we understood that the very big chaos which started there with a lot of resentments and with a new kind of nationalism which was quite uh, childish and crazy, but who reminded us of another bleak period uh, of the country with another type of dictatorship, the, the right-wing dictatorship. And this uh, uh, kept me here. I, was, I did also a lot of bad things here, which were not very well received there. I mean, I, I wrote about things which happened there before and after. I wrote about this new transition, which was a very mixed one with a lot of old people uh, and, and corrupt people. So uh, I was not the hero of uh, the, the, this transition. I wonder if- And I stayed here, yeah. I wonder if by, if by having included you in this anthology, I have, a, I have wronged you. If you should actually be in an anthology of exiles, do you feel comfortable in any way with this rubric of being an immigrant writer? You're an this, exiled writer. This is a difference uh, about which I don't care a lot. As long as you are in the anthology. I am here. No, I didn't know that you took me in the anthology. It was a surprise, but it's fine with me. And if you make another anthology about exile writers, you should You'll put me there too. <laughs> <laughs> Jamaica, you were saying in the conversation with the students some extraordinary um, things, some very vivid images about the envy that you had um, if I understood it properly, um, even before you came to the United States, envy or m maybe desire to be an African American. Oh, yeah. I wonder if you can, can, can say what it means to you to have inserted yourself from Antigua in the United States mm -hmm. in, the, in the context of race in this country. Yeah, well... Um it was uh, um, two things. I grew up in this island that was very uh, much, um, it was colonial society, but colonial society on an island is even more oppressive than on a continent, as you can imagine. Uh, the whole weight of the British Empire, but on, you know, 108 square miles as opposed to Africa, India, you know, Asia. Um, I think in India they stopped celebrating Queen Victoria's birthday with independence, which was in 48. Um, when I was growing up, uh, we still celebrated Queen Victoria's birthday as if she had not died. I, it was a surprise to me that she had died. I mean, I knew she had <laughs> died, but that she had really died <laughs> was, uh, I, I didn't really understand that. Um, so the op op oppressiveness of uh, col colonial society um, on me, uh, um, this little girl, you know, um, uh, I understood that I could never be an English uh, girl, and 
well, to say understand isn't really the word, but somehow I knew I would not be an English person. I would not be a British person. I would not have yellow hair. I would not have blue eyes. I, my skin would um, only get blacker in the sun. Um, I, under, I knew that what I wouldn't be, but what I would be seemed a form of death, and even though I wouldn't have that kind of language uh, to speak, to speak of it, it, it seemed to me just um, uh, uh, uns unbearable. On the other hand, I had images of people, um, uh, Americans, um, who I now see white Americans, where they were sort of like English people, even though they really weren't. But then there were these other Americans who turned out to be African Americans who were just wonderful. They had fabulous hair. They wore fabulous clothes. They loved to dance and hang out, and they spoke wonderfully. Uh, everything about, um, and in those days it was a Negro, um, everything about a Negro or uh, a, a American was for me um, just the most desirable thing in the world. And I think I, uh, I used to pretend I was um, an American, but a black American. And uh, then, as I was saying, I came to America. I used to pretend I was a lot of things, including I was also Charlotte Bronte. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose that only speaks to the imagination is so vivid and full of every, a little bit of everything. Charlotte Bronte, an Africa, a black American singer, you know, it's all in your imagination. Anyway, um, I did come to America, and the first thing I did was just to try to be a black American or a Negro. And much to my uh, dismay, uh, most uh, black Americans I met didn't like me at all. They hated the way I talked, uh, made fun of it. And um, uh, there were a group of people I knew uh, who'd always go to clubs and so on, and uh, you know, popular music. They knew a lot of popular music and, and so on. And I would go with them, and lo and behold, I couldn't dance, and they would make fun of me. Um, uh, so that, that, you know, was my, my, my experience was, uh, um, oh, oh the, the, the thing that I was saying earlier is that also when I came, it was this remarkable moment in African-American history, uh, 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 the civil rights movement. Um, when I was little, uh, a little girl growing up, I understood that there was this problem with race, people who looked like me in America. But for some reason, I thought this all happened in the area of places called Mississippi and Alabama, and that Mississippi and Alabama seemed to be not proper names. You know, they seemed... Um, names that you would find where savage people lived. And so I just vowed when I came to America, <laughs> I'd never go to Mississippi or Alabama. I would just stay in New York because New York was America. I, I want to I just uh, um, push you a little further on the issue of how you spoke. Did, did the fact that, that uh, African Americans made fun of your accent made you ashamed of that accent, made you want to change that accent? Made you um, want to just be like them and, and pass? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, uh, it's very odd. No, I didn't want to uh, change by the way I, I talked. Um, I wanted to be, on the other hand, some version of my distinctive self. Actually, what happened is that when a certain group of people didn't like me, I gravitated to the group of people who liked me, who turned out to be not African Americans, and um, who were what you would call white Americans, but I never noticed that. Um, the thing I loved about African America, as I say, was very facile, very um, superficial, uh, the identity, the identification uh, I took, but actually, that superficialness um, was very useful to me because I identified with what I thought was a freedom to be my true self, you know, to sing, to, um, to, to be an artist, to be creative. I identified being an African-American 
as being a creative person. Mm -hmm. And so I, even though African American culture um, didn't really welcome me, and for a very long time when I was writing for The New Yorker, if I came to give a reading somewhere, the majority of the audience was not African American. And it would bother me, but not enough to make me not right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, no, I never, uh, I never, I never did that. The, when I became an American citizen, I very much, um, uh, when I, I, I looked at American history and a lot, I read a lot of it and very much identify myself with African American. I would say I'm an African American if you were asking, um, but uh, it, it's true that it's, I didn't feel, you know, that I was welcome. On the other hand, I have to say, any, I always feel any place that would welcome me is not the place I really want to be. <laughs> Do you want to, Jessica, take it from there? Or <laughs> I actually have a question for you. She um, said it so well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, one of the things that attracts me and fascinates me of your work is the, is the popular culture level that, that is present in it. And I wonder if as a child, as an adolescent, um, you had a connection with American pop culture that eased and greased your entrance to this country in a way that we seldom really pay attention to. The fact that we, that I grew up in Mexico, but I grew up with American culture in such a way that arriving to the United States was like coming home mm -hmm. in certain ways. Mm -hmm. You were talking earlier on to the students about reading comic strips and Talk to me a little bit about pop culture in the Philippines in arriving here and your connection to literature through that side. Well, uh, there were two levels of, of the pop culture, which I think I mentioned earlier. There was the Filipino comics, which were sold on the street and you could, you know, buy a different one every other day and I love them, and there was certainly the, the radio dramas, which I also spoke about, which were done in Tagalog. In, I grew up in Manila, so the language we spoke was Tagalog, but there are many languages spoken throughout the Philippines that are you know, their own thing. In other words, just because you know one doesn't mean you're gonna know the other. So it's 80 languages spoken, hmm. as well as dialects, so. Um, but, then we, of course, had been colonized by the Americans, and so in my school, when I was growing up, we were taught in English. We had the Tagalog um, language class, which was ironic and bizarre to me. Much later, I realized, well, that's so perverse. And, um, but, you know, we didn't question it, um, and we, read a little bit of the literature in Tagalog, but primarily what was foisted on us was, you know, whatever you were reading here. Maybe we were a few years behind, but certainly um, also Kipling, um, <laughs> one of your favorites. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I sort of got it, and movies, you know, um, didn't have television for a long time. So it, the big treat was to go to the movies, and I love the movies, and I loved, we had a great um, local industry then, um, and I loved the Filipino movies, the musicals. Th they were doing them in my childhood, you know, and the horror movies, and then of course the big Hollywood movies. So any chance I got. And I, you know, I fell for that sort of belief, and it's a cliche now of, oh, that must be what the U.S. is like. But I mean, I wasn't that stupid. And I did come when I was 14, so I understood that, hmm, that was, you know, the celluloid thing. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, there was an ease, but there was also a bafflement, I think, and a tension a lot of um, question about who, who are you. I mean, I got what you got, which is you don't look Filipino. So I would just say, and I think I told you earlier, you know, well, okay, I'm Chicano. 
will you buy that, you know? Um, because I'm not gonna go into this long explanation of the hybrid culture mm -hmm. and all. I didn't even have the language for that. So there was an ease, but it was surface, you know, and I think people could smell that pretty quick. So English was always your, your home, and in many ways it's your body that changed from one mm -hmm. geographical location to another, mm -hmm. but you were always at home in the English language. Yeah. There's a lot of debate these days about immigrants make, not making it in the, mm -hmm. in the Americans' melting pot, if it still exists, mm -hmm. because of their lack of access or their lack of knowledge of English. Can you imagine yourself having arrived to this country like Norman, mm -hmm. with another language at 14, 15, mm -hmm. and what? I think it would have been even a different kind of a struggle. And I have the deepest admiration for writers like Norman and Alexander Heyman, who learned to write in English at the age of 40 or whatever, you know, and is brilliant at it. And I think I learned to love my own, even though I spoke English easily, it was a different kind of English. It was sort of like I was talking to a Filipino artist years ago, and I said, oh, well, you know, you're so facile in Spanish. And he goes, no, but when I went to Spain, they laughed at me because mm -hmm. I was speaking medieval Spanish, yeah. which is what <laughs> they were speaking in the Philippines. It was like, they were like, what are you talking about? You know, he was so, and I thought, oh, my God, and the English I spoke was pro too proper for the school I went to. And so now when you go back to the Philippines, you are the gringa. Yeah. In the way you speak, absolutely. in the way you dress. But I can speak the other languages. You can so pretend. I can pretend a little bit. But yeah, my attitude is different. But in the Philippines, you're a tourist today. I'm totally a tourist. I'm a melancholy tourist. <laughs> Norman, is it, is it a prison to be living in one country and dreaming in another language and existing in another language? You write sometimes in English, but it's, Romanian is your language, and what I've read of yours, which is substantial, comes to me as a reader through translation. There's a mediator in between you and me who is filtering the material, and who in some ways is also the creator of Norman Mania for me, is that obviously that is productive, you come to readers, but that is also a prison? Talk to, talk to us about living in translation in a world where your readers are not immediate, next to you. It's a kind of schizophrenic uh, life. And because you have to be grateful uh, to the translator, and you would kill him, rather. <laughs> so, because uh, the core of your thinking, which is in the language, very often doesn't go through. Also, because of this, what is called here, the industry of the publishing, uh, it has to be made more accessible, more available, and this is uh, not necessarily something bad. It's related to a democratic society, but in the same time, you as a writer feel uh, very often frustrated, fractured, and wearing uh, some dresses who are, that are and are not yours. Still, when you see the book in the window, you are pleased. Mm -hmm. This is also related in a way to the, what I would call the theatricality, theatricality of the exile. Because you come here at a certain age, I will not say the age, <laughs> and you have to play the child who understands even if he doesn't, and to look to a reality which you are very eager to understand because it's strange, it's new, it's challenging, 
and in many ways it's extraordinary. Yet you are handicapped. And not only is that you are handicapped as a, as a dentist would be, who also has his own frustrations, but as a writer who lives in the core of, of the language. So it's a tricky, complicated uh, story. Um, to be more epical, I would say that my very first book here uh, at Grove Press had eight translators, <clears throat> and none was real because all of them delivered very bad translations. And I had to work with the editor to rewrite every sentence, not knowing English. But I had good luck that the editor knew French. I had the book in French and in Italian. She looked to the book and she rewrote with me, speaking with me in my odd English, <laughs> uh, and sometimes in French. Uh, but these names were not real. But I would assume there's, there's an added element to that, and that is that after 20 years living in the Upper West Side, your Romanian must not be fresh. It's not fresh. I'm also not fresh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we can move on. <laughs> <laughs> it is a coherence here. <laughs> but from what I understand from my Romanian readers, because I, I started uh, in the last years especially to publish also there, uh, from critics there and, and good readers and friends, writers, my language is, is good, is okay. So fresh, I don't know. <laughs> So, uh, but, but fine, yeah. and uh, so, but now even the English, as you, I would hope, agree, improved uh, from the time when we had our first interview. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Jamaica, you wanted to say something. Well, I, as you were, you were talking about, um, uh, in, in a way, uh, writing and then the translator, um, it, it rings a, a strange bell for me in that I write in English and my readers are in English, but the, when I started to write, the, my audience, which would be the people on this island, um, never read it. I, uh, well, where would they find the New Yorker? But um, which is where I, I first started uh, to write, uh, my writing first appeared. But even uh, more extreme than that, I hoped they would never see it because I was writing about them. Um, so uh, I'm thinking if, if it's, it's sort of an, in, an inverse uh, mm. uh, problem, I, I, I of course wanted people to read me but I wanted uh, the people, y you, you are from Romania, so you write in Romanian, and ordinarily your readers would be Romanian. I'm from an island. I write in the English. They speak English. But I hoped they would never read me. And, uh, well, at first I knew they wouldn't because they were so far away out, outside of the world I was, write I was publishing in. Uh, but then secondly, I... I hoped they never would because I didn't want them to see uh, um, <laughs> that I was writing about them. But, but why, why, why? Would, mm -hmm. would they be ashamed of what you were writing? Would you be ashamed of how you were describing them? Yes. Was that a, a, a were but you it's falsifying? How it, it's how well, you write about your family. Would you like your family to my see? My family didn't like right. what I wrote about so them. So that's it. <laughs> I should say that I, am, I try not to be ashamed of anything. Um, so it wasn't that I was ashamed of, of them or, or, um, uh, or anything like that. I thought that if they knew I was writing about, about them, they would try to stop me, not through any legal action, but just through um, the sheer power they, they had uh, over me. But um, again, it's... Um, 
you know, for me, it was um, the primary usefulness of, of coming to America, of being an immigrant in America, was that I could uh, uh, be myself in a way that I couldn't be myself in any of the other possible places I could immigrate to, the main one being Great Britain. But, but let me see if I understand. What you were saying is that your target, was your target reader in Antigua as much as the topic that you were writing was the island itself? Or even though you were writing, or you were writing in the New Yorker not about Antigua but for American or for English language, who was your target? I had no target. I was just yes. writing and mm -hmm. hoping it would be published, and it was. And I then had to in, in, uh, take into consideration all the things that would come after it's published. When, uh, like any of us, when I'm writing, sure. I never think of anybody, but I must write. And then, of course, there's the consequences um, <laughs> after uh, uh, you write. Um, but um, I mean, to uh, uh, um, just to say that my my writing is so tied up with the this specific immigrant experience that you, we are talking about that for me, without it, I cannot imagine being the person sitting here. Mm -hmm. I have just, a question. You have Jamaica. a question, please. Yeah. Just, because I'm really curious uh, if you've been back at all. Oh, I go all the time. You do, and yes. do, are they reading you now? Uh, oh, very much so. Okay. And um, they take turns um, being proud of it or wishing I right. would go. Right, me too. But you know, it's interesting now, because whether you go back or not and deal with that or, you know, it's Jessica, I wanted, I, let, me, let me take that to, again, the next, step, the next level. Um, does the immigrant writer write for the immigrant community, for other immigrant writers, for the country where she or he has arrived? Does um, Jamaica just put it, we don't write with a particular audience in mind. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, let's be honest too, we're mm -hmm. hoping to find a reader and we imagine that reader to be someone that is like our neighbor who happens to be an immigrant or like our teacher who happens to be not an immigrant. So I wonder if you, looking back at your own writing career, if you can see a shift in who you write for. Do you write, did you begin writing for the people of the Philippines or your family or already the people here, other immigrants? Is, is, does the immigrant writer write for a particular audience? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I can't answer for every immigrant writer, but I think oh, earlier... Well, I don't see why not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but earlier we had that great question by the young man, and I think um, uh, we started talking about it. It came towards the end of that encounter with, with the students, but I think it is about... Uh, writing a good story and that niche you know happens through someone else's intervention you write I hope you know everyone reads me and whoever reads me I'm very happy and grateful you know I write for myself and then I hope there are those readers out there and because there are different connections when you go back to your, when I go to the Philippines and I sit there and I listen to my readers there talk to me, it is profoundly moving in a different way than when I'm here. You know, it's, it's a different, you know, experience. It's, it's sometimes painful, it's heart-wrenching, it's wonderful, and they get everything, you know, in a different way mm -hmm. than readers here get it, you know. But for me, I'm not saying one reader is what I'm, no, but I we had another wonderful question from one of the students who said, "Do you represent?" I love, you know, my one of my sons, my 18-year-old son, uses the word "represent" like this. I <laughs> represent. Doesn't there's nothing after? I don't represent this or that. I simply represent. represent. And I I wonder if you represent, meaning that because you are the only or one of the only Filipino American writers. Even if you don't want it, and I'm sure you don't, you all of a sudden become the spokesperson for 
those that are like you who don't write or who don't speak. And that creates what? Some discomfort? A headache. A headache. And what do you do with that headache? An well, aspirin? you try to answer very sincerely and sort of... In the beginning, when my first novel came out, that happened really to an annoying degree where people, you know, some terrible thing would happen in the Philippines. You know, really, there were these awful things going on. And like a newspaper person would call me up like I would have the inside scoop or something. And I said, you know, there are other people you could call. Finally, I just got so like, I live here. Why don't you ask me about, you know, the subway breaking down or something? So they'll trot you out. I mean, it goes both ways, you know. You get trotted out for certain events. And, but no one ever asks you, well, you also live on the Upper West Side or you live downtown or you live wherever you live. And how about those issues, you know? So, um, you know, I had to just sort of put a stop to it. But it is, it's also, you know, it is a responsibility. You try to say, I don't represent, I am not the spokesperson. And yet, you know, it is something that... Um, you're forced to grapple with every time because how will everybody, they don't know who else is out there. So either I recommend other people to go talk to or I just say, you know, I don't know, but um, this is what I've heard, hmm. you know, but this is only what I've heard. When, you try to deal with it like a real person, I guess, is all I'm <laughs> saying. But, you know, journalists don't often take that answer. But even in terms of uh, an audience member asking a yeah. question as if you were supposed to answer for a nation. Before, before we go to that section, I, I asked um, the three of them to choose a, a writer in the anthology that is not themselves to, and read the piece to us and then just say a few words about it. But before we do that, I'd like to ask you, the three of you a question. We have been talking about how the immigrant writer changes or doesn't change in what she or he undergoes through the process of writing and through the process of immigration and the discomfort and the happiness. But I wonder also if you can say a few things about how, how America has changed as a place for immigrants. Um, one of the pleasures of editing this anthology is that, as I see it, it's a, it's a history of the English language in the mouths or in the pens of immigrant writers that have adopted it and adapted it into their own means of expression. And it is also about how America has become tough or soft, depending on the period. The anthology is organized, not chronologically by the date of birth of each of you, or each of the authors, but by the moment of arrival hmm. of, the, of the immigrant. I wonder if you see the United States today more open to immigrants, to the immigrant experience than when you first arrived less so, more intolerant. Any thoughts? How, is, how has the country changed? You start with the youngest? We start with the youngest, yes. Okay. Um, from my point of view, and it's not necessarily a personal point of view, it's a more general point of view, uh, I think America was more open when I came than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very welcomed when I came here. Uh, people whom I did not know uh, helped me a lot, were interested in my story. Uh, now, because what it happened, meantime, especially in 9-11, but probably not only, it is uh, a different situation. Uh, I don't think it's a better one. So I think... Uh, Is it a temporary one? Will it go back to uh, We are all of us temporary. So uh, I cannot speak <laughs> I about... I am not going to ask you any more questions because I... <laughs> uh, I cannot speak about what will happen in, in, in 10 years or in 8 years. It can be a better situation. Uh, I am by nature a pessimist, so I have only good surprises. <laughs> but one of the big, uh, tougher confrontations here was with a country which is by nature optimist. And you being more American than me, you should be optimist. 
And you should find yourself the answer, not ask me. You will not find the, yeah, the good answer. I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> okay. Jamaica, is the country more or less tolerant than when you first arrived? Well, I think it must be more tolerant because the um, anti-tolerant language is louder but there are more of us than when I came. Uh, Who's here. us? Who's us? Uh, us foreigners. Uh, I'm an American citizen, but um, there are more of us from all over the world than uh, when I first mm. came here. I hardly uh, knew, I had never met a Ghanaian, even though I had Ghanaian pen pals. I never met anyone from. Uh, I hardly knew um, a person from Mexico when I came here. Or from uh, Romania. In 19, oh, uh, certainly not from Romania. Sure. <laughs> but um, uh, the country, ha it is more. Look at all the different people um, um, there are. I don't, I, uh, the, 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 la the opposition to openness has only grown louder in response to that there, there are a lot more people of different uh, backgrounds here than than ever before, and uh, uh, a part of the um, anti language, uh, I think, will be seen or can be seen as an attempt to deal with all of us being so different. That, and I'm not being an optimist, but. Um, uh, uh, you know, I run up uh, uh, against people, and I'm an immigrant, I run up against people, as I say, that I never thought I would meet um, in anywhere in the world. Uh, so uh, I think when I came to America, um, I don't know how many Antiguans uh, there were in America, but there are a lot of us here now. I mean, there are people who come and have their children born mm -hmm. here, so their children can be American citizens. Is there, I think it's a very uh, open country. It's it's bound to be. The world is the world is a very open place. It's in 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 some ways um, it's a, the openness is tough, but it's it's happening. Jessica, uh, there are lots of black people in China. There are lots of black mm -hmm. people in Russia. There are lots of people everywhere. So the, uh, I think it's not being optimistic. It's just true. Yeah. That Jessica. I think that's a super fraught situation, question, answer. I'm sort of more with Norman on this one, um, but I also believe that, yes, there are more of us here now, and certainly we're in New York, so that's a very different, you know, but you go to Minnesota, um, and there are Somalis there, and yeah, you know, Hmong and Hmong. Population. Yes, um, everywhere. but I think, the. The atmosphere is tense, and I think, you know, it, it, it caused me to choose the selection I chose tonight. I think it depends on who's immigrating. I think the situation with Mexico has gotten worse from what I see. The border stuff is, is, is disgusting to me. And, you know, as a person who grew up in California, I feel like it's gotten worse um, rather than better. And so I think it depends, you know? I think it's very complex, and I think, yes, I'm glad I live in New York, and New York is, is you know, a very special city, but I, I, I don't think there's one answer for this. Since you talked about their readings, I, I'd like you to read very briefly, and if you can introduce the writer that you chose and why you chose it. Do you want to start, Jessica? Boy, you're bossy. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job today. I'm also the editor. Um, I chose Edwige Danticas um, excerpt, which I've excerpted even further, from her memoir, Brother, I'm Dying. Um, with, because of its timeliness, it, it came out in 2007. I think she's really writing about how peop certain people are treated today, and it's very moving. And uh, also because I read her piece in the New Yorker last week about her cousin Maxo, who figures in this piece, and he died in the earthquake. And I just, you know, yeah. 
So can I go up there and do it? Sure. Can I have your permission to move? You have my permission. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, just because sitting down and reading is not my thing. Thank you. I hope the microphone is on. Is it, is it on? Yes. Okay. I'll try to be really fast. In her memoir, Edwige writes about the last days of her father suffering from pulmonary fibrosis as well as her 81-year-old Uncle Joseph, who sought asylum in the United States. After a battle between gang members and UN peacekeepers led to the burning of his church and threats on his life. So that's a little context here. I also mention Chrome, which is a detention center in Miami for immigrants awaiting their immigration status, and Bel Air, which is a neighborhood in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. My uncle was now alien 270-41999. He and Maxo had left Port-au-Prince's Toussaint Louverture Airport on American Airlines Flight 822. The flight was scheduled to leave at 12.32 p.m., but was a bit delayed and left later than that. Once they got off the plane at around 2.30 p.m., my uncle and Maxo waited their turn with a large group of visitors in one of the long Customs and Border Protection lines. When they reached the CBP checkpoint, they presented their passports and valid tourist visas to a CPB officer. When asked how long they would be staying in the United States, my uncle, not understanding the full implication of that choice, said he wanted to apply for temporary asylum. He and Maxo were then taken aside and placed in a customs waiting area. I don't know why my uncle had not simply used the valid visa he had to enter the United States just as he had at least 30 times before and later apply for asylum. I'm sure now that he had no intention of staying in either New York or Miami for the rest of his life. This is why, according to Maxo, he had specified temporary. Had he acted based on someone's advice, on something he'd heard on the radio, read in the newspapers? Did he think that given all that had happened to him, the authorities, again, those with the power both to lend a hand and to cut one off, would have to believe him? He planned to stay at most a few weeks, a few months, but he was determined to go back. This was why he'd gotten his police report from the anti-gang unit. This was why he had wanted the officer, a justice of the peace, or an investigative judge to go to Bel Air to witness and inspect so he could return when things were calmer and reclaim his house, school, and church. He had said as much to Taunt Z the day before. I can only assume that when he was asked how long he would be staying in the United States, he knew that he would be staying past the 30 days his visa allowed him, and he wanted to tell the truth. Maxo and my uncle were approached by another Customs and Border Protection officer again at 5.38 p.m., at which point it was determined that my uncle would need a translator for his interview. Maxo, a fluent English speaker, could not as his son act as his translator. Documents from the Bureau of Customs and Border Protection indicate that my uncle was interviewed by an officer Reyes with help from a translator. A digitized picture attached to my uncle's interview form shows him looking tired and perplexed. His head is cropped from the tip of his widow's peak down to his chin. The picture shows a bit of his shoulder which is slumped back away from the frame. He is wearing a jacket, the same one that, according to Maxo, he'd been wearing since he left his house in Bel Air. Though he is facing the camera, his eyes are turned sideways, possibly toward the photographer. The interview began with Officer Reyes asking my uncle, do you understand what I have said to you? Yes, answered my uncle. Are you willing to answer my questions at this time? After making my uncle swear and affirm that all the statements he was about to make would be true and complete, Officer Reyes asked him to state his full name, Dantica Joseph Nosius, answered my uncle. 
Of what country are you a citizen? Haiti. Do you have any reason to believe you are a citizen of the United States? No. Do you have any family, mother, father, brother, sister, spouse, or child who are citizens or permanent residents of the United States? My uncle replied that he had two brothers in the United States, one, my father, a naturalized US citizen, and the second, my uncle Frank, a permanent resident. Now he goes through this horrifying interrogation and fe is fed soda and chips. This is an 81-year-old man um, who's very ill and speaks through a voice box. And then he's taken to a detention center with his son, Maxo, and when his son, Maxo, says, please don't put my father in handcuffs because he's very old and very ill, the customs officer re relents, but then he says, but be sure you tell your father that if he tries to escape, he will be shot. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I'm going to read um, from uh, Edward Said's uh, um, memoir, Out of Place, and I chose it because it's so, uh, the experience he's describing quite much mirrors my own, um, the sensibility, the feeling of it anyway. Um, he, I don't think I need to tell you who Edward Said is. Um, but he writes about coming to America uh, out of, in this, it's, um, it's his biography, autobiography, memoir, and as I say, it's called Out of Place. Uh, I am only now aware, it's the second paragraph of this I'm beginning, I'm only now aware that those talks before we were to leave for the United States constituted a sort of leave-taking ceremony. Let's go to Groppies for tea for the last time. Or, wouldn't you like us to go to Cursal for dinner once more before you go? She would ask. But much of it took place in some complicated labyrinth of her own making, which also involved the arrangements she was making for herself and my four sisters, whom she would be alone with after I left. There was something so terribly giving about her attitude in the last week before we packed the house for the first stage of our trip via Lebanon. As I later realized, she thought of that giving as motivated entirely by, an un by unselfish love, whereas, of course, her sovereign ego played a major part in what she was up to, namely, struggling in a limiting domestic household to find a means of self-expression, self-articulation, self-elaboration. These, I think, were my mother's deepest needs, though she never managed to say it explicitly. I was her only son and shared her facility of communication, her passion for music and words. So I became her instrument for self-expression and self-elaboration as she struggled against my father's unbending, mostly silent iron will. Her sudden withdrawal of affection, which I dreaded, were her way of responding to my absences. From 1951 until her death in 1990, my mother and I lived on different continents, yet she never stopped lamenting the fact that, alone of all her friends, she suffered the pangs of separation from her children, most particularly me. I felt guilt at having abandoned her, even though she had finally acquiesced in the first and most decisive of my many departures. The sheer gravity of my coming to the United States in 1951 amazes me even today. I have only the most shadowy notion of what my life might have been had I not come to America. I do know that I was beginning again in the United States, on learning to some extent what I had learned before, relearning things from scratch, improvising, self-inventing, trying and failing, experimenting, canceling, and restarting in surprising and frequently painful ways. 
To this day, I still feel that I am away from home, ludicrous as that may sound, and though I believe I have no illusions about the better life I might have had had I remained in the Arab world or lived and studied in Europe, there is still some measure of regret. This memoir is on some level a reenactment of the experience of departure and separation as I feel the pressure of time hastening and running out. The fact that I live in New York with a sense of provision, provin provisionality, despite 37 years of residence here, accentuates the disorientation that has accrued to me rather than the advantages. We made our annual removal to Lebanon in late, late June 1951 and spent two weeks in Dar. Then on the 15th of July, my parents and I departed from Beirut airport by Pan American Stratocruiser for Paris. From almost the moment we stepped off the plane in Paris until we left for London by night sleeper, I was afflicted with a plague of styes in both my eyes, which apart from two small apertures, effectively closed them. This aggravated the sense of, drift, of drifting and indeterminacy that followed my withdrawal from all aspects of my familiar world, the sense of not really knowing what I was doing or where I was going. Within hours of arriving in London, where we stayed grandly in an imposingly grandiose suite at the Savoy, my cousin Albert was summoned from Birmingham, where he was doing a degree in chemical engineering and was installed luxuriously with us at the hotel. He appeared to be unaware of the tensions between my father and his brothers, so jolly and admirably rakish did he seem while with us. I spent many hours eating my first fish and chips with Albert, visiting the new Battersea Fun Fair, and going to an unending number of pubs in search of girls and excitement, all the while trying to learn from him the arts of enjoying oneself without fe feeling either guilty or lonely. He was the one Close, he was the one close relative whom for the first 20 years of my life I found myself hoping to emulate because he was everything I was not. He had an erect posture, was an excellent footballer and runner, seemed to be a successful ladies' man, and was a natural leader as well as a brilliant student. London was certainly the most pleasurable interlude of our trip. The moment he left, his tonic effect dissipated, and I settled back into the anxious gloom of the trip. Thank you. Thank you. I will read a page from Joseph Brodsky. I assume you know who he was. He was a, poet, a Russian poet from Leningrad who uh, was persecuted by the Soviet authorities. He was sent for 18 months for hard labor in the Arctic because of his supposedly pornographic and anti-Soviet poetry. He refused two invitations to migrate to Israel in 1971. Finally, he arrived here. He uh, received, as you probably know, the Nobel Prize in 1987 and was also a poet laureate of the United States. The text is called The Condition We Call Exile. Life in exile, abroad, in a foreign element, is essentially a premonition of your own book form fate, of being lost on the shelf among those with whom all you have in common is the first letter of your surname. Here you are, in some gigantic library's reading room, still open. For one in our profession, the condition we call exile is, first of all, a linguistic event. His trust from, 
he retreats into his mother tongue. From being his, so to speak, sword, it turns into his shield, into his capsule. What started as a private, intimate affair with a language in exile becomes fate, even before it becomes an obsession or a duty. In a manner of speaking, we all work for a dictionary because literature is a dictionary, a compendium of meanings for this or that human lot, for this or that experience. It is a dictionary of the language in which life speaks to man. Its function is to save the next man, a new arrival, from falling into an old trap or to help him realize should he fell into that trap anyway, that he has been hit by a tautology. This way, he will be less impressed and in a way more free. For to know the meaning of life's terms of what is happening to you is liberating. It will seem to me that the condition we call exile is up for a fuller explanation, that famous for its pain, it should also be known for its pain darling infinity, for its forgetfulness, detachment, indifference, for its terrifying human and inhuman vistas for which we have got no yardstick except ourselves. All I am trying to say is that given an opportunity in the great casual chain of things, we may as well stop being just its rattling effects and try to play causes. The condition we call exile is exactly that kind of opportunity. Yet if we don't use it, if we decide to remain effects and play exile in an old-fashioned way, that shouldn't be explained away as nostalgia. Of course, it has to do with the necessity of telling about oppression, and of course, our condition should serve as a warning to any thinking man toying with the idea of an ideal society. That's our value for the free world. That's our function. But perhaps our greater value and greater function are to be unwitting embodiments of the disheartening idea that a freed man is not a free man, that liberation is just the means of attaining freedom and it's not synonymous with it. The highlights of the extent of the damage that can be done to the species, and we can feel proud of playing this role. However, if we want to play a bigger role, the role of a free man, then we should be capable of accepting, or at least imitating, the manner in which a free man fails. A free man, when he fails, blames nobody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nora. I'd like to conclude um, this section um, of the readings and of the discussion that we've had and open it to the audience with one more very brief piece that I'd like to read. Um, just about everything in the anthology um, is authored by an immigrant who puts his or her name into the piece and authors it, um, except for one single section in the anthology that is made of anonymous poems by Chinese immigrants who were detained in uh, Angel Island in San Francisco Bay. 
uh, as a result of the Chinese Exclu Exclusion Act of 1882 and then repeated in, in the Immigration Act in 1917. These poems were engraved or written on the wall in Angel, Angel Island and then were transcribed by different editors. Um, they come to us translated, obviously, into English and the translator of this very brief poem is uh, Jenny Lim. Instead of remaining a citizen of China, I willingly became an ox. I intended to come to America to earn a living. The Western style buildings are lofty, but I have not the luck to live in them. How was anyone to know that my dwelling place would be a prison? Thank you. And this is the time, for, hopefully the lights can come up and for the audience to uh, ask if you have any questions to anyone. Thank you on the panel. I think the microphones are. They are here. Are they, are they gonna, okay. Uh, so if there are any questions from the audience, you are um, welcome to come to the front and ask them. Um, the gentleman. Is this on? Go ahead. Is mm -hmm. it on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you made the distinction between exile and immigrant uh, clearly in, uh, in terms of being sent out versus wanting to go out, although in many, many, many cases I think that many people find themselves somewhere in the middle of a continuum where they are neither purely exiles or immigrants, but there is actually an interaction of two forces. What I want to ask in addition is, is there, a, is there any room for the word emigre as opposed to immigrant? Um, was Nabokov an exile, an immigrant, an emigre? Uh, I like for myself to think of myself as an emigre, but I'm not sure whether that's not just the narcissism of a word in italics and with a nice accent. Uh, <laughs> is there any uh, real distinction one can make? Thank you for your question. Uh, the only thing which I may uh, say about this, which is, of course, a complicated one, even a linguistical uh, problem, is that Nabokov left Russia because of the Russian Revolution. He couldn't go back. If he would have gone back, he would have been in, in a very bad situation. So the first condition, I think, is you cannot go back. If you come here for different other reasons and you can go back, you still have a choice. If you cannot go back, you are here uh, willingly or, or not willingly, and you, wherever you take it as an exile, as an immigrant, as a refugee, you are in a certain situation. For instance, now a lot of people who came from Eastern Europe here and could not go back can go back and don't want to go back. But they came here as exiles and they are now, if you want to consider so, immigrants. So I would say that it's, uh, it's a difference and I, I don't see it as I said. As a, as a great, uh, of great importance, for instance, uh, Brodsky is in this anthology, I see. And it, was he an immigrant, or was he forced to come here? Of course, as you can see, he could have been go to, gone to, to Israel, but he didn't want. But in the end, he came here. Uh, was Solzhenitsyn an, an immigrant or an exile? He was sent with a, with a plane to Frankfurt uh, and not allowed to go back. So it's, it's, it's different, and I don't know. It is certainly psychologically important if you can go back or if you cannot go back. But if you stay here, that's it. And, then, and there, of course, Norman, there are other layers to this. In, in, in trying to create this current of narrative, that is an anthology. 
I, I pondered in, in the, try to tackle the questions, um, is a settler, the early settlers, were they immigrants? Is a slave an immigrant? No, a slave is not an immigrant. A and slave is a slave. A slave is a slave. And then there are the refugees, and there are the immigrants themselves, as we talked, and there are internal and external immigrants. There was the big question, Jamaica, for instance, of uh, wondering if Puerto Ricans should be part of the anthology. Literally, essentially, they are traveling within the country, but they see themselves as immigrants from the island in the Caribbean to the mainland, um, and, and, uh, and seeing them as immigrants in some ways breaks the pattern, but also I would like to think expands the parameter of the circle. Yeah, but I assume that when, of course, all these things, all these nuances are, are important and are real. I assume that one criteria which you took in account was the quality of the writing. Of course. Uh, because this is a book uh, uh, published by, by the Library of America. And what I said at the beginning, and I would uh, say again, it's good to be in this book. I feel now that I'm here, not only as a citizen, but as a writer too. Well, the, the question of immigre and um, immigrant, it's really interesting. That You make me think a lot about this because it, um, let's say you are a, a Jew coming from uh, Russia at the same time as, as um, Nabokov. Uh, you also can't go back, um, uh, but you don't call yourself an immigre. I've never heard a person, a Jewish person who, uh, who comes from Russia call themselves an, an immigre. I think an immigre is something um, people like Nabokov, whom I admire very much as a writer, but probably wouldn't like as a person at all. Um, it's not the only case. Uh, it was just people like that. Um, mm -hmm. And not, no offense to the person who asked the question, who thinks he's an emigre. Uh, but really, I, I think an emigre is a class thing. And um, most people, uh, like me, we're immigrants. And all the money in the world, we don't consider ourselves emigre. I think it's a... And if I were you, so if I were giving you some advice, just say you're an immigrant. The immigre business is safe. Hello. We have a question here. I'm curious to know, how do you all define home? And also, um, what is home to the person who is in exile in one's own country? The question of home. Uh, in the, in the, we can speak a lot about this, but in the very end, the home is your language, I think, in our case at least. And uh, alone in that room with your language, be it the new, be it the old, be it the combination of both. Mm -hmm. In the case of some of, of, of the writers in this anthology, Norman, and of course, not all, you are an example, um, language is home, but we, we change homes. I, I was born into Yiddish, switched into Spanish, uh, lived in Hebrew for a while, now make my life and my living in English. Um, I try to think that the other homes have not disappeared, that they are still there. I try to furnish them. I try to keep my Spanish alive, writing in it and Yiddish, and, and Hebrew. Um, so it's only because you have a bigger apartment. It's <laughs> nothing more than that. It's funny. It's still it's home. Funny. I have a, oh a summer God. home. <laughs> still home. Yeah. What is home? But I, I don't know about la language um, being home. Those of us who um, have uh, had to describe certain situations in the language of the people who have 
um, made the unpleasant situation find language uh, complicated. I, I, when I'm thinking about it, uh, have a, com a difficulty with English, but it is the only language mm -hmm. I have. So um, it's, it's lovely that um, uh, for you that your language is a, a home. I, I find my language, English, uh, um, complicated. Um, so, so is 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 home something other than, than language for you? Home is is place. I um, when I, I sometimes live in Vermont, and when I'm in Antigua, I say I'm going home, meaning Vermont. When I'm in Vermont, I describe Antigua as home. I now live in California, which I don't describe as home at all. I think I'm visiting mm -hmm. uh, Cal California. I think the question um, of home is a troublesome, again, like uh, uh, one for me, and I'm always on. Uh, I'm always irritated wherever I, I am, but I like it. And I irritation like is good for, for writing. Yes, it's very good. Jessica. <laughs> yes, and I think earlier we also had this great conversation with the students about notions of home and, and how writers actually thrive on being uncomfortable and, and um, you know. Irritated. Irritated and um, overly complicated. I mean, yes, we thrive on this. A home for me is many things, as I said earlier. Um, uh, it's also your body. And, and I feel like New York is home in one way. When I'm with my children, my daughters, I feel very at home. And it's really the, the company, the atmosphere changes for me. So wherever we are, it feels very homey. So it's not even a physical um, place, you know. Um, and in the Philippines, I feel at home in a particular way that is perhaps, you know, that nostalgia, my, uh, the deepest, deepest... That's where I was born and where I became a writer in my mind and, you know, my imagination was formed. So it can never not be home. But, yes, it's a fraught idea again. You know, it's like immigration versus what about being called an expat? Because that's, I don't know, in Mexico, but in the Philippines, they'll call you an expat rather than, you know, uh, now you're a tourist. But, oh, here comes the expats. In Mexico, they call you all sorts of things. I know they do. <laughs> And, and um, I don't know if when I go to Mexico, I still go home. I think uh -huh. it's, I still go, I still try to go to the place that wants home mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we have time for one more. Oh, but you have a crowd. Um, we have a crowd, but I have a statement here that I will be shot if I, so. Um, Maybe. You want to you wanna ask? Earlier during your discussion with the students, you guys said that you identify yourself as American writers. Do you guys also write in your native tongue, say like Tagalog for those who's a book, or Spanish? I know Norman said that he writes in French and Romanian primarily. So like, what, what, do you identify yourself as a French and a Romanian writer as well? Hmm. Are you a, a French, Romanian, American, Jewish writer? Yeah, this is about the identity of the writer. And the identity of the writer is his language. So I am a Romanian writer living in New York. I am Jewish. I know several languages. So I have several identities. But as I explained to, to all of you, the entity which is at the core of your thinking and being and which is, in the case of the writer, uh, the language, I think, still, uh, is, is Romanian for me. Well, I, I write in English, and so, you know, I'm a writer in English. Um, sometimes I'm an American writer, sometimes I'm a, just a writer, just a writer. Um, and, you know, we should tell the young people that they can ask us questions out there. Yeah, but I think that okay. let's ask these two more questions. Yeah, since this, good. Uh, I'm on, glad. On this, uh, Jamaica, you but, want to answer this part? Oh, um, no, I was just thinking that somehow the, the question of identity doesn't, isn't um, something that just slips off the tongue anymore. It's, it's a mouthful. It's mm -hmm. a huge paragraph. 
And um, uh, so, you know, what kind of writer are you? Well, I am an American citizen. I, my writing life is in America. Um, but I write about Antigua, I've written about Vermont, I'm, you know, I, it's, it's no longer just two words and a hyphen in between them, it's, it's complicated, and it's, you might be the last, the youngest um, writer who can uh, have an identity so that just slips Chris. off the tongue, the, that more and more it no, will it's, be No, it's there. how I think about it. It's not that I don't also write about New York, as, uh, as uh, he mentioned, or even about Vermont, but I don't think it's about the topic on which you write, uh, because the, the topic can be whatever topic, yes. Okay, we're gonna go fast. Uh, go ahead. Um, the census is coming up, and I know that if we uh, say African American, it's the African were born here from slave, and so uh, my concern is how we gonna call um, the black or new immigrant from Africa from the island um, in the census. Yeah. You know, a while ago when he was alive. Um, Oh dear, what's his name? Um, Clark, uh, he was, I'm sorry? John Henry Clark. John Henry Clark? No, Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark. Um, the New York Times had an interview with him and they asked him a lot of questions and uh, one of the questions was um, uh, that uh, African Americans had gone through a set of names, um, Negro, African American, Black, and. And, um, and he was asked, well, what should they call themselves? Uh, and he said, white. <laughs> and because none of the, uh, it's, sure. none of the names make, um, satisfy anybody. Everybody's always trying, and he says, it's white. And so when the census comes and you don't like any of the names, <laughs> White will do really well. I do other, other, <laughs> other is good. Yeah, I well, just... African American is perfectly fine. If you don't like it, be white. It's fine <laughs> too. It's all right. Lots of people are white. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I came to uh, to listen because I was I was born here, and I have you know friends that are that are immigrants, and with different feelings. So I wanted to hear what you know immigrants from different countries and backgrounds, you know, had to say, and I guess I don't think that this is the place to, to even raise a discussion about African Americans and people that were enslaved, because it's a completely uh, different, you know, discussion. But I, I, I love listening to all of you and hearing about your experiences, and Ms. Kincaid's kind of touched me the most personally, but I actually wanted to say to, to you, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Stevan, mm -hmm. your last name? is that I, I personally took issue with you using the term passing to Ms. Kincaid oh. because uh, I, I'm just from my own personal you know, feelings because uh, that's a, a term that's been used here for African-American people that were light enough to pass for white. And then later on, you asked her if she felt ashamed. And I just wanted to say that people, she said that she wanted to be free to be whoever she was, and that's what it's about. It's not about trying to be anybody else. It's about wanting that same freedom that you see other people have, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. And the thing about the oppression is that you are taught to be ashamed just for being who you are. And I just wanted okay. to say, I hope that there's no kind of imposition of your own you know, thinking and maybe kind of a little, maybe prejudice in the anthology and so that everybody gets to kind of speak for themselves and there's no sum summary of what people are, are, are writing. Thank you. No, it's fine. Oh, um, uh, none was intended and um, I'm sure and on my part, Absolutely. I didn't perceive, but I, I thank you very much. We both thank you, Absolutely. I'm sure. In the last, at yeah, last. I mean to violate the rules. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here today because I think it's incredibly courageous 
for you to share your stories. Um, I don't really know where I fit into the mold because my parents came here as immigrants and I don't know if I had a say in that at the age of eight. What advice would you have for children of immigrants, especially like I see a lot of young people here today of our generation who also want to share our stories and maybe haven't yet developed a narrative but still think that it, we have a responsibility to share the story of what we went through and are still going through. A wonderful way to finish. Um, and let me add to this, because um, I, I want you to be the ones, obviously, but I had somebody recently in an event similar to this one, um, a, a mother who came to me, a white mother who came to me and said that she had two daughters from different parts of the world that were adopted, that she adopted when they were very little, uh, one from Asia, one from Africa, and she wondered if those daughters, if she should see those daughters as immigrants. Anyway, what advice would you give to the young people here about their finding a voice and a narrative? Norman? I would uh, give the advice which I give always to young or old people, to be themselves. I don't think it's about responsibility necessarily. It's about how you feel. If the environment in which you grew up seems to you extremely interesting and can be interesting for other people too as a human experience, of course you, you can do it, but it's not necessarily about about responsibility. You can write your memoir when you will be 28, as I am now, but uh, you, you, can't, you can't forget about it. It's, it depends on your impulse. It's not necessarily about, about uh, responsibility. It's how you feel, what kind of wish you have, and, and, and what, what expresses you the best. Uh, my advice would be uh, to, to young people is to um, read books, 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 not um, electronic readers, books, buy books, <laughs> and don't be afraid to read on, until you go blind. It's a, you're going to go blind as you get older anyway. Um, and uh, when people say, how did you go blind? It's like, I read too much. It's such, a, it's such a great sentence. I read too much. <laughs> well, I would say it's an interesting, it's a great question you asked, um, young lady, because, you know, I, I have my two daughters who, we're our New Yorkers, born here, and I don't have advice. I, I just hope that um, you know, you shouldn't have walked away so fast, wherever you are, there you are, that it's a very rich history you have, and through the reading, perhaps, and through curiosity to, you know, to know that in yourself, that you're, you know, it's, it's a great narrative, and I hope one day you're curious about it. That, that's all, to, to have great curiosity. That's my only advice. And I would say that uh, one of the greatest pleasures of literature is to, to enter in conversation with the text that you have in front of you, not to see it as a dead page with white with black signs, but as a page where you are involved and you are angry by what the writer said or you're happy and moved, and that that should lead you to conversations with living authors that can complain or be anxious or be impatient or be funny or be sad. Um, in the end, it's all a big dialogue open-ended that, uh, that doesn't cease, where you insert yourself somewhere, um, it started way before you, and it will continue way after you. Thank you very much for Thank the Thank you, Elon. Thank you. <laughs>